Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Sam Curtis of Polite But Dangerous Tools. Sam hails from Alaska originally and makes knives that reflect that state's rugged terrain. Each knife a unique take on a theme, using natural materials, each one different from the next. He's got knife making in the family. His brother was a recent guest here, and he's trained with some of the best. But the individual character and story of each of his knives seems to tell uh, that story is what holds my interest. I want to find out what inspires these tribal creations. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share the show with a friend. You can also download it to your favorite podcast app. And as always, check us out on Patreon, where you can get some exclusive uh, interview extras and other perks. Uh, join us there at theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Sam, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, uh, as I mentioned up front, uh, I think I misspoke when I said you hail originally from Alaska. I know you ended up there. Uh, yes, originally born in North Carolina, spent a lot of time there, came here uh, through the Army, ended up in Kentucky, Georgia, New York, Germany, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Alaska, and Arizona. Finally, we just decided on Alaska once we got out, and we're, that's where we're at, at now. Wow. So uh, as as I was saying, your knives seem to reflect some of that. You know, I have these impressions of Alaska and I think they're they're somewhat accurate as being incredibly wild uh, and just vast. And uh, your knives have a sort of mm, natural and tribal feel to them. Um, how How is Alaska? You know, t- tell me what it's like to live there and how it's affected you and and uh, your perspective uh so i think there are a a couple things that i look for in knives one i want every single knife i make to not only be as functional as possible but i want it to also be representative of who i am as a person and tell a story in a certain way so i'll give you a good example here i've got this uh i've got this knife here i'm going to show you my children and i spend a significant amount of time outside on trails We've got animals all around here. This looks very simple. There's not a lot to this, just a, you know, small, simple seven inch blade. Uh, but every single part of this blade is actually meant to help them track animals in Alaska. So from the seven inch overall length, which matches a standard um, moose track to the four inch handle from the bottom here out to the four and a half inch where you can see a little divot here that matches the uh, length of an average snowshoe snowshoe hair track. Uh, you've got caribou tracks, and then you've got, uh, if you look from the top of the thumb ramp here to the edge of the blade, that's actually the length of a common Sitka uh, blacktail track that we might see in the area. Wow. So a lot of these uh, are meant to kind of be indicative of the area we're at. And we've had some people ask to make knives like that before, and once we go over the process, they want them made for the same area that they're in. Um, one of the things that you'll see on some of the other knives is that a lot of times we try to cover up the full tank as much as possible. And that's indicative of Alaska, too, where you're seeing knives that are meant to serve a specific purpose. Uh, but they're also meant to um, be helpful in the environment we're in. For example, some of our uh, cord wrap knives and things like that, I'll show you. One here. These are meant so that whenever you're out in the, you know, out in the woods at negative 20, negative 30, something like that, you can get something called steel saturation with a cold environment where the steel is going to become the same temperature as the area around you. If you touch that with a bare hand, then you're going to get frostbite, things like that from touching the steel. So uh, there are a few elements of that from Alaska that we put into it. Uh, The other element that we put in a lot is uh, we use a lot of moose 
And most of that's because it's so easy to come back here. There's a roadkill moose right beside of us right now uh, that we've had two of them right now. So it's very easy to get moose handle bones. It looks good. It has that uh, natural older aesthetic that we look for in knives. So a lot of those elements going to play in the function, the look, the aesthetic, and then the ability to use it to kind of also help us in the environment. Uh, that I really love the concept of, first of all, I can't imagine uh, moose roadkill, like what a moose does to a vehicle. I can't imagine. Uh, but the concept of designing the knife and building the knife in such a way that it's a useful tool in the environment other than um, for just cutting and, and uh, you know, uh, um, bushcraft kind of stuff. Uh, but, the, you know, the, the way that you have measured it all out uh, to to um, uh, the tracks of animals that you're going to find in that area. I think that's a, a really uh, cool and somewhat scalable idea. I mean, you could basically do that anywhere. No, absolutely. I think what you do with some of this, I think it's one thing to make a, a knife. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to bring this one up again. So you could have, you, you see a lot of these people make multi-purpose fixed blade knives and you're gonna have a saw back here or you're gonna have a bottle opener here a lot of things that actually take away from the functionality of a knife i've cut my hand on the a bottle opener on the back of a knife before uh there's a lot that you can't do as far as applying pressure to the back of the blade if you have a saw blade there so uh, it's something that's doesn't take away from the functionality of the knife necessarily it adds function without adding parts that will take away function if that makes sense yeah, yeah, it does. And and it also takes advantage of parts of the knife that are already there and just mm -hmm. distributes them in such a way that it's useful. And and also actually it 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 looks pretty graceful uh on the the knife itself, that divot in front of the thumb ramp and then the whole curve of the spine of the blade. It's a very nice looking blade, as are um the rest of your knives. Tell me about how um, you got into knife making and, and what informs the, the aesthetic part of your design, the non-functional part, but the beauty part. So I started knife making with, uh, with my dad. Uh, I think a lot of people my age did the same thing where, uh, the hunted had just come out. Everybody wanted to, uh, make a knife. Everybody wanted to go live in the woods, make traps, stuff like that. Um, but we were very fortunate that my dad had uh, the tools to do everything with. We didn't know what we were doing, so we went to Home Depot. We bought mild steel. I think we bought a 36-inch long piece. We shaped it into what I can, I would now describe as one of the ugliest-looking knives ever. But we did it together, and we kind of worked through some of those things. Uh, I was very young when I did that. I started making uh my first real knife about 18 years ago and really start working on that. I think, uh, I haven't posted this yet, but I have it here. I made uh, a tracker from that on a bench grinder. Uh, so this is the tracker that I originally made. Uh, and this really is when I talk about what forms my decisions on knife making a knife like this is what really kind of, helps inform me because you see this in a movie and you see Benicio del Toro and he's throwing it like crazy and he's fighting somebody with it. And it, do, it this does everything. But then when you start using a knife, you start to see some things. If you use a knife regularly that become flaws where here we've got a hollow grind matching up to a convex grind at an angled point. And so you start realizing like, well, Hey, this, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't add up to something that's going to be functional in the way that I use a knife regularly. Um, I'm going to have a snag point right here. And so as you start making knives like that and you start using them a little bit more, I think what you see is, Hey, these are, there's a difference between the aesthetic and, uh, the function of a knife on that same hand. I think being in the military, everything's given to you. You have a pattern you're going to wear. You have gear you're going to carry. Everybody's got the same rifle. You can tell somebody's rank by the optic they have on their rifle, uh, by how it's set up, even if you can't see the rank on them. Um, <clears throat> and I remember hearing a quote, somebody saying that, you know, it used to be that when people went into battle, 
they carried weapons with them that matched their personality. And Union soldiers, when they would drop uh, their old Winchester lever actions, and they would get picked up in ambushes by Native American uh, soldiers, that the next time they saw those same weapons, they would have feathers tied to them. They'd have carvings done into them. They've had these, you know, decorative beads and other things like that put into them. And the same person was saying, you know, all we have left for the soldier to choose, customize, and display who they are is their knife. And so in that vein, I want something that's functional. I want something that, uh, that meets a user's in needs. I want something that I'm going to be comfortable carrying anywhere I go, but I also want to be a knife that somebody's going to want to say, this fits my personality. This fits the way I'm going to carry it. And this fits the style of, uh, weapon I want to have on me. Like if I, if I were to die right now and somebody were to come over my body, this is the weapon I want to have on me. Except you don't want that guy to get it. That's the only thing. But <laughs> but what? So what do you? What kind of person do you think uh, fits your knives? So I, I really there there's there's really no difference between a knife you're going to get from me and your that you're going to get from any other maker functionally. I mean these all have brass pins. They all are pinned the same way. The same amount of resin is on them. The same amount of epoxy is on them. The same amount of stain, the same amount of sculpting is going into them. What you're going to see is that they, they're going to have the obsidian kind of napped features on the blade. You're going to see that sculpted handle style. It's going to be irregular. It's not going to be, um, it's not going to look consistent throughout. It's going to have irregularities in it. I think the kind of person that's looking for one of these blades wants something that's functional, but they want something that displays a, displays almost a primitive travel type of knife. Yeah. Something, some, it's almost like something that gets you in touch with the, uh, with the warrior class throughout history, uh, in a way, you know, um, because the, the, the quote unquote tribal nature of your knives, um, I, I'm not exactly sure I could put my finger on what tribe, so to speak, but it has that, uh, your knives have that feel. Um, and in a way it kind of attaches you to everyone who's carried a knife, either into battle or into work, uh, you know, throughout history. I, I mean, I think you see, you see this with a lot of people. We, um, one of the last classes I did in the, in the army before I left, and this was a while ago, but it was on, uh, it was somebody talking about the theatricality of warfare and how, how, we represent ourselves to the people we're fighting often kind of gives them an idea of what they're going to come up against before we ever get into that spot. And I think the same thing, you know, you, if you, you go through the South right now, go to any farm you want to, I guarantee you're going to find a case pocket knife, a <laughs> case trapper in every farmer's pocket. It just, we either that or an old Smith and Wesson farmer. You, there's something that about a certain style of knife that attracts a certain style of person. Yeah. And then you can also display who you are by the certain type of knife you carry. So, uh, yeah, well, that's true. And uh, a lot of uh, people who, you know, watch this show or who are attracted to this kind of content. Yeah, really, um, you know, begin to identify uh, in some ways with their taste with knives. It's kind of like music when you're in high school, you know, mm -hmm. you kind of identify with that music and and. Uh, you build a little part of your identity around it. It's, it's kind of the same thing, especially if that's not just a collecting uh, a yeah. piece for collection, but it's a piece you're actually going to uh, rely on. You talked about um, you were in the U S army. Thank you for your service. Thank and you. Uh, yeah, I, I thank you. And, um, and then I know you went on to use some of that training uh, to do other more law enforcement style things. And then your knives are born out of a usage. So obviously you've had a lot of usage in your past. Tell me a little bit about your experience in the army and then, you know, what you've done afterward and how knives have fit in. Uh, so, and this is going to lead into kind of why I make knives the way I look into the way I do. Um, with me, a lot of this stuff is very nostalgic. 
Um, and so there are little elements that uh, I'm going to carry through with nostalgia, no matter what experience I was in. Uh, so I was a uh, an infantry officer in the army. I was stationed in Fort Wainwright. Um, we were there for uh, a few years, uh, and in that time, I was a strike platoon leader and then a, a scout sniper platoon leader. Um, the scout sniper platoon got kind of transformed a little bit into a mountaineering platoon. So what we were doing was we were actually looking at uh, over snow mobility, ways that you can tra traverse the snow um, quickly, efficiently, and tactically, which is something that's very difficult to do when you're looking at Arctic considerations. And then uh, at the same time, we were also trying to incorporate some of our scout sniper techniques, our hide sight techniques and stuff like that. Um, in that, you're looking at knives that you have to do a few different things. Uh, on the on that side, one you want something that's light because you're in an alpine environment carrying uh, 60, 70 pounds of carabiners, ropes, things like that on the scout sniper side. Um, we did that for a while. Um, you really have to be light and fast, but you also need something that when you get to your final destination, you've got to be able to chop limbs uh, as very fast without carrying something that's going to add more weight to you. Hmm. So weight and balance is a huge thing in that regard what you want is uh in some of these trackers uh i don't think i have one here with me right now but there's a significant difference between where you're taking away weight on the you know on the handle side and mm -hmm. then where you're adding weight and where you want that weight to be with balance because you need something that's as light as possible while still able to chop, while still able to perform like a tomahawk, a planing knife, anything like that, if you're chopping something down without burdening you. Um, <clears throat> from there, we went to uh, Arizona. We had a transition from the infantry side to the intel side. Um, on that side, uh, we went to Arizona. Everything was very hot. You're really not carrying a lot on you at all. For the most part, every knife had to be very light. Um, and at the same time, you don't have a lot of things that you're chopping down in the desert or anything like that, which is something I think we, we've seen both Alpine, uh, in, in the Arctic and, uh, in the desert, you're not chopping down a lot. You're not doing a lot of things like that. So the idea that you have a knife that can perform well, be light, but also if you need to, can be pushed into those certain tasks was important. But at the same time, then we were moving into, uh, Intel environment where we were going into, um, I was going to an aviation unit that was attached to a special operations aviation unit. We were moving into uh, from New York to Germany at the time. And we had to carry knives that met uh, European regulations. And at the same time, we could use in a variety of different ways. So there had to be a balance between something you keep on, you kind of hidden, uh, something that met European laws across different countries. And then also could be forced into a variety of roles really quick. So what what kind of knife did you find to fit that kind of role? So one of the things that uh, one of the knives I very much preferred, depending on the country, I carried an SOG Pentagon for a long time. Um, I absolutely love those knives and the fact that you can use different edges for different tasks at any different point was very, very effective. And it was super light. It was very fast. And those are a lot of the qualities that I try to put into some of these knives now. At the same time, you couldn't carry it into uh, five of the countries that I was in charge of. So I was in charge of uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Germany, Poland, and Turkish uh, mm -hmm. Intel teams dedicated to the aviation unit. Most, uh, quite a few of those countries, you couldn't carry a double edged knife. So mm -hmm. at the same time, you had to have a single edge knife, fixed blade, not folding with a blade under. I think in some cases, if you're going to carry it everywhere, I think it had to be under, uh, can't remember the metric version right now, but it had to be under three inches mm -hmm. and you had to be able to grab it quickly. Um, it had to be, uh, it couldn't be locking or anything like that. So that kind of stuff dictated the way that I was carrying knives for a long time. With the DOJ, uh, after leaving the Army, uh, I moved into a DOJ intelligence position as a contractor. I was assigned back to Alaska uh, to support DEA and FBI 
uh, operations against uh, opioid diversion up here. And at that point, I wasn't allowed to carry a firearm anymore. So the only thing that I could have on me was a knife and it had to meet certain uh, certain parameters. The generic term in Alaska is other than ordinary. It can't be something that's an other than ordinary knife. So you start what does looking, that mean? I, I don't think anybody knows what that means, but that's how it's written down in law. So that, that was kind of what we were limited to. And you, you kind of start looking at things a little bit differently at that point. And that's where we really started looking at some of our knives that could carry out a, uh, a different purpose or carry out the purpose that we were looking at while looking like they weren't meant to. And I'll show you this right now. I think huh. I've posted this before, but this is a, this is kind of built on a European based open uh, mushroom knife. A lot of people up here collect mushrooms and it has that downward taper that a lot of people use in the calcium knives, reverse edge. It can be used very, it can be used in a very tactical manner. It's got the brush on there, uh, similar to the open L mushroom knives where you can brush off a mushroom or anything like that. It could be used to prune mushrooms and everything like that. But obviously somebody who knows what they're looking at is going to understand that this also has a different purpose. And you carry it in a lunchbox and you've got the, the a perfect everyday carry knife that's definitely not meant to serve a tactical purpose. Definitely not. Yeah. I don't know what you how how you could possibly use that. Uh, so I want to back up a little bit and talk about the design, the tracker design. Um, I okay. know you had that up um, as an example of a of a very early blade of yours, and one that you've made uh, you've made that pattern before, or at least were inspired by it uh, as it came through to to us all uh, in the hunted. Um, but is that a really useful blade uh, style, or is that jack of all trades, master of none? Uh, I I wouldn't say it's a jack of all trades, master of none. But here's how I look at the tracker style design. One, I look for certain features when I do it. There, are some people can do a a hollow grind to convex trans transition on a tracker very easily, and there, it's a great knife. But I think that people need to look at it for what it's worth and I'll, for how it's supposed to be used. And I'll show you this. So if I have a recurve blade like this, I can I kind of know that I'm going to use this as a – I'm going to use this for more detailed stuff. I'm going to use this edge for more chopping. People don't seem to have a problem with that with puckeries or with anything else. But I think where people use a tracker is I think they buy it for – a certain look and then they don't use it the way it's meant to be used. For example, I look at a tracker and I see I've got a planing edge here. I've got a tomahawk edge here. If I need to draw down, sometimes what I'll do is I'll take a bandana. If I'm using this for, you know, small tasks. And if I can't use this edge here, I'll wrap it around and now I've kind of got a skinning edge here. Mm -hmm. So I've got a knife here that can do certain things. But if I try to use this for, let's say, general skinning or anything like that without taking into account that it's actually three different three different tools mixed into one, what's going to happen is I'm going to drag that knife. I'm really probably going to get upset with the friction at one point where I start hitting that edge, that gut hook area that a lot of people call it, and I start pulling down on that. You're not going to connect with the material that you're trying to cut the same way that you would with a normal knife. And so with the trackers, normally what I tell people when they ask me about them is I say like, Hey, look, if you can part this knife out, you're really going to have a better product. If I look at that and I've got a, a planing edge, I've got a draw knife, I've got a tomahawk, I've got a gutting knife and I've got all that in one area. And I know how to use each part of that. Mm -hmm. I think it's great, but I think it's similar to a folding multi-tool. You don't want to use, you're not going to open up the bottle opener on your multi-tool and expect it to por perform the same way that your knife would. This is that just spread out over a fixed blade knife. All right. So let tell us how you got actually started in making knives. So what was the uh, spark? I know you said you started with your dad and it was the hunted, uh, but, but the actual, um, you, you started to say you got some mild steel from Home Depot, but how did it go to a point where you're making real legitimate knives and, uh, you know, 
so I had an opportunity uh, at the college I went to to work with a master bladesmith. And then at the same time, uh, there were a whole lot of abandoned vehicles in the area. They were asking people to clean up. We were getting 4140 steel off of spring leaf and things like that. And we had an industrial engineer shop on campus at Appalachian State University. So we were able in our free time to just go to the shop and uh, make whatever we wanted. The tools were there. You just had to sign in with your card at the time and you could make anything you wanted. At that point, we started working with some different, um, a friend and I started working on some different knife designs and started really trying to play around with stuff and say, you know, how, how easy is this to make? What can we really make from here? What tools do we need? What works and what doesn't? Um, will welded steel work as well as monochrome steel? Will any of that perform the same way? And from there, we just started playing around with designs, which is still one of the things I like to do today and why I like to use scraps and things like that, because you, I think you learn a lot uh in those areas so that started uh i want to say that was 2010 2009 or 2010 when really started getting into all that um practicing heat treating and practicing different designs and saying taking them into the woods uh appalachian state is surrounded by forest uh mm. i was lucky enough that all of my classes were tuesday thursday schedule so monday wednesday friday i was out in the woods so i'd make a knife uh i'd make a knife probably Monday or Friday and I would spend the next Monday, Wednesday, Friday out in the woods using it, uh, 2009 or I'm sorry, 2010, 2011, may have been as early as 2009. I'm sorry. Well, can't remember when we started doing that, but went out all the time and just started using these knives. And really, I think the use was what kind of drove everything else. And then we had a couple things at the house. Uh, we couldn't carry much because we were traveling so much with the army, but we carried, uh, I would say five or six tools, belt sanders, grinders, a couple of things like that, that were used when we'd make probably uh, one to two knives a year uh, based on whether we're giving them out as a gift. I think the most we ever made in one year prior to this uh, was maybe eight, I think it was eight knives. So it's so, very slow, but. So at this point um, now, uh, Tell me about your process and and how it grew uh, to be, um, you know, you were talking about one one to eight knives a year. And now, um, you know, how did you get to this place and what's your process? Uh, so the first thing I always uh, want to look at with the process is looking at a blank piece of steel. And I do stock removal, knife making. Um, I'm not forging. I'm not making Damascus or anything like that. We get that question a lot. Um, I'm sorry if you hear that. We live in between an airport and a, we live in between an airport and a military base. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> there may be some stuff going around. Uh, but no, the first thing I want to look at is uh, what the intended use is going to be. What are you looking at in terms of uh, knife function? And you're going to see with some of the knives that I post on my page, um, we have some knives that are very forward heavy. They're going to be tip heavy. We're going to have some that are going to be very tip light. It's a very intentional design. So if you're looking at something like a Quaken, something like a Tonto, and you're looking at that, a lot of times you want balance to be a little bit more handle heavy, I think, so that you have more control over where the tip's going to go. Mm -hmm. If you have something that needs to be the exact same weight, but you need it to be, um, more of a chopper, more of a general tool. I like to put the weight near the front a little bit more. That way you've got a tool that can kind of balance itself out and work through uh, tougher issues and stuff like that. So always intend a purpose. The second thing I do is look at what I want, uh, how I want the knife to uh, perform in terms of the bevel, the initial bevel, how, how much I want to be able to chop, everything like that, how much I want to be able to cut, do I want to be a slicer? And then the last thing that I go into is as once I have that shaped out and the knife is balanced the way that I want, and I start removing weight from either the, the pommel area or the guard area to really line up the weight where I want it. Then I start looking at aesthetics and I think, where is this going? And what's this person going to want to look like? Uh, and for the most part, the people that reach out, 
I, I feel like a lot of people reach out uh, based on aesthetics first. And then as mm -hmm. they talk about knives and stuff like that, we will end up having the discussion about how we built that, what the balance is, why it's built the way it is. That way somebody who buys one of these knives also knows this is how it's going to function when I use it. So looking uh, at your page, we were just scrolling through. I saw, uh, you know, sax. I saw Bowie. I saw um, uh, a, another knife that uh, I talked to you about that I thought was a sax, but it's something else, a Genop or something. Uh, but my my point is, you see a lot of different influence uh, going into these. They all have a very uh, unified style or aesthetic, and it's very definitely yours. Um, but uh, they they seem like they garner inspiration from a lot of different places. Uh, do you have an interest in historical knives and knives of other cultures? Oh, absolutely. I think any time that a culture has dedicated themselves to making a certain style of knife, there's a reason why. So yeah. maybe if you find, uh, you know, when people talk about archaeological sites and they talk about Clovis points and Folsom points, uh, the issue is not why they made the first one you found or the anomaly that you found, but it's why they continued to make that pattern. Um, and so I think that definitely shows a level of expertise and a level of something working. Um, and I think when you look at each of those areas uh, and you look at what those people were building and then what they were, the environment that they were in, uh, for example, I mean, when you look at areas that had almost no, uh, vegetation or anything like that. When you look at the Arctic, knives are small. They're, you're not going to see a chopper. You're not going to anything like that. But they continue to make the same pattern over and over because it's effective, because it works in the environment that it's in. I think some of the ones you were talking about, so this is oh, yeah. one of the ones that you talked to me about before. This is based on a, uh, an African gardening tool. Right. And you can see as you look at it that it's very it's extremely light. This is actually lighter than most pocket knives I have, but the weight is all four. You can see that it kind of gets a little larger up near the tip of the blade and it has a drop off. That's a very, very steep cutoff for what you'd consider for what a lot of people would look at as a, a sax, a sax warm cloth style knife. This is a sharp drop off, um, but you still have a lot of weight right here. Then you have this tip-up design. That's something you see in a lot of guarding tools and you see in a lot of sack size, the older historical ones, where you have the tip that rises up. It's not completely flat because as you're chopping, you've got your weight right here. So this is going to be the point that's, of the knife that's actually going to contact, probably going to make contact with what you're chopping at. So this is more of a balance issue on this one that kind of drives this. So yes, it looks it looks older. It looks historical. It looks like you would fit in a, in a primal uh, movie or something like that. It looks like that, but it's still engineered with pins in the same position, weight where it's supposed to be, a tip that's able to be uh, sharp while you're not relying completely on tip for chopping or anything like that. And you're not going to take as much uh, shock by shock to the hand by having that weight a little bit farther back. So that uh, that knife that you just held up, um, and others uh, have that handle. Is that moose? What what are you dealing with in terms of these materials? Well, it, de it depends. I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you a few here real quick. So I've had a lot of questions about what kind of sax this is, and uh, and people normally don't believe me when I say it's a gardening tool. It's based on a gardening tool. Um, <laughs> That is a black spruce handle that's been dried out for about four years. And it's been, uh, normally after that, I'll cut it and I'll look to see if there are any imperfections, anything I don't want. I'll stabilize it with soaking it in linseed oil. I'll wait for that period of time. Once I put it in, I'll drill through the knife handles first before I do any epoxy, just to make sure that it's not going to crack, just to make sure that's stabilized enough. And then I'll wrap the cords around the pins and things like that. This okay. is a this is a definite sax pattern. You still got the tribal wrappings and everything here, but this is gonna this is a birch. One of the things that I look at a lot of times with knives is I want to be able to tell you a story. I don't want to tell you 
hey, this, I got this from this store. I did this. I, I can tell you where this birch came from, where it was cut down, and tell you why this pattern is the way it is. This is based off a Scandinavian pattern that was found, I want to say, in a, uh, a peat bog. Uh, mm. And we had no interpretation of what the handle looked like. So a few engineers looked back and said, hey, I, we, we think it would have had this pattern. Uh, so, and that's a birch. Then we got this sax here in this Odin branded leather sheath. Uh -huh. This is more of a kind of what you'd see as a traditional working sax. Same obsidian pattern, edge is a little bit more mirror polished. This is a moose handle or a moose handler handle on this. Uh, so, this was taken by splitting uh, a section of a paddle in half uh, down the middle and then taking out all the pith, making sure that there's no pith within the handle that's going to touch the blade at all, putting pins in and then wrapping that again in a, a kind of travel wrap. So the pith, uh, that's the, the soft part inside the horn. It, is that right? Yes. That I is. mean, it's inside the antler. Uh, does that, it, the reason you want to get that all out is because eventually it'll rot away and cause a void in there or is that, no, it's that you don't get as much contact between the antler and the steel. So you're going to run into a point at some anytime you're using natural material, you have to take into account how it's going to degrade, what's going to happen uh, to it over time and everything like that. Um, but with any type of antler, you're going to have a pith inside. It's a core that's kind of crumbly. It's going to fall apart at some point. If you leave that pith in there, what's going to happen is that you're going to see over time that it's going to start falling apart inside. And okay. it's generally so thin that resin's not going to seep through it. So if you have, you know, your tr traditional epoxies and stuff like that, it's not going to seep in through the pit. It's not going to get enough contact to hold the antler to the handle. So I'll show you this again real quick. Uh, so one of the things that we do, uh, so we have on this like a traditional uh, just birch handle knife. We've got the handles on here. They're, they have epoxy holding them to the blade. There are brass pins underneath each of these uh, wrappings. Then you're wrapping it in either an artificial sinew uh, or you're wrapping it in something. I think this one, I can't remember what this thread is. I think it's a, this may be a, an older fishing line, I think, for mm -hmm. a older halibut rod. And then you're soaking that in epoxy as well. So even though these look like they're older, older style knives, they look like they're, you know, not put together the same way. They have all the same structure that a modern knife would, but at the same time, they also have the additional strength. This is 200, I, 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 this is 250 pound test line now that I think about it, wrapped and then soaked in epoxy again. Oh, wow. So the mechanical connection on those, even though they look old, is extremely strong. So are those uh, full tang or is that is that a um, uh, a stick tang inside uh, a board out, completely board out? No, they're all full tang. They're all full tang. Okay. Oh, yeah. cool. All right. I mean, because uh, yeah, that's another part of working with natural materials that you have to be aware of. Well, you were you were talking about um, entropy and natural degradation of natural materials, but especially if it's a stick tang. Um, you know, you can you can see how wood or horn or something like that can crack and then you're really up a creek. Whereas if you have it a full tang and, and the scale cracks, you know, it's it's not that big a deal. Uh, in terms of sheathing, what do you uh, what do you do in terms of, you know, securing these things? Because, not you know, you know your blades have that ancient look, but they're also meant to be used by people who use knives on the daily. So they have to have some sort of, you know, sheathing uh, and, and maybe uh, I would assume somewhat modern. So how do you, uh, if you're a soldier and you want to carry one of your knives, how do you do it? Uh, so there, there are a few different things that I do with sheets and space on the overall design. Uh, if you don't mind, I can take a second and show you some of the oh, different knife do. designs we have here. All right. All right so uh, this is something that we made recently. A little wonky here. Um, so this is a 
regular this is something you'd see regularly with a sheath this is a buckle on it that buckle also performs as a whistle inside you have a tool that acts that can be tied up uh, to either perform as a tomahawk tying a stick vertically as an adds or it can be used as an ulu the sheath itself apart from that buckle has a striker inside you're looking at a single flap with a inch and ruler mark or inch and centimeter marker on it as well as sos directions to find north on the back you've got an inclometer uh you've got a sundial that the let me see here oh that's cool a sundial oh, right a sundial and then you also have inside here um directions on how to signal airplanes and stuff like that so that's held in place by a buckle it's about the size of an altoid can wow when we're talking about sheathing on other knives let me grab this real quick well what do you what so do you call that i'm sorry before I'm sorry. you get before you get to the knife sheath uh sheaths what do you call this survival pack uh and, I don't think right now we even have gotten the names. I think right now what we're looking at is just describing what it is, how it can be used, how you can use it for different functions and things like that. Um, so this would probably just be a, this would probably just come as a, you know, with a description, not a name or anything like that. Gotcha. I think really what you're looking at is somebody, uh, you're looking at something that you can take in the woods that somebody who knows what they're doing can probably perform a variety of survival tasks with one simple tool that doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, a lot of friends of mine worked a significant amount of time in Africa. Uh, and one of the things that they, they always comment on was how you didn't want to carry a pack because it was hot all the time. Mm. So the amount of stuff that you could keep on a belt that you could keep small, that you could keep light was extremely important. So when you're looking at something like this, the fact that you can carry all those tools, especially if you're doing survey work, if you're doing recon work, if you're doing scout work or anything like that, to be able to carry a small light tool on a belt that could perform in a big way uh, was extremely important to them. With these, uh, this is kind of what we offer on some of the knives now. So this is one of our tracker saw knives. This is a loop on the back. I don't know if you can see that, that holds a fire steel. Oh, cool where the fire steel becomes the, res the retention portion of it. It's very simple. You just put your hand on this leather flap here. You push back. It's off the knife. And then you've got your knife ready to go. That is so cool. So with a sheath like this, one of the things that we wanted to also make sure was that you had everything you needed in a, this is a fairly traditional, older style looking sheath. Uh, some of the features that we have on it, of course, it's got the fire steel. It's going to lock it in. The belt lip or belt loop on the back has inch markers and centimeter markers, which may not always sound important, but a lot of times what you do if you're doing a site recon or anything like that is you want to be able to include something that has a scale on it. And everybody's not carrying a ruler on them. A lot of people don't carry uh, multi-tools or anything like that that always have the inch markers or anything. You've got a compass built into the bottom of the belt loop. Huh. And then <clears throat> apart from uh, uh, going back from there, you have an inclinometer again. You have the same sundial loop. And that sundial loop on here holds 25 yards of 250-pound test cord with nine beads in case you need to make a pace counter out of it. So, again, this is a system that's very easy to walk around. It doesn't take up any more space than a regular knife. But at the same time, it care it kind of performs like an entire uh survival kit yeah this is that's very cool it's it's so modern primitive you could see um i mean you could see uh highly trained or you could see trained soldiers and people like that using that knife you know it reminds me a bit of how uh the you know the seals like uh, the Navy SEALs, uh, you you hear a lot about the equipment they like to use, and it's not all super high tech. I mean, a lot of it is, but not all of their kit is super ultra modern. You know, some some of the stuff, some of the knives they like, the tomahawks and stuff, you know, they have an older feel to them. 
And uh, I, I love that. It's like a connection to the past. Uh, like I was saying before, kind of a connection to the people who carried those kind of things before them. No, absolutely. I think, I, I think that's one of the things that goes into that warrior mindset is that really the only thing you have left, you're going to get your rifle issued to you. It's going to have the optic on it that somebody wanted to give you. It's going to have the uh, mm -hmm. night vision that somebody wanted to give you on it. It's going to be set up the way that somebody else wanted you to have it for whatever role that you were put in. Really, the only thing you have a lot of customization over is that knife. And that doesn't mean, so I think it can uh, it, it can go two ways. Um, you can have a, a lot of people perform very well if they know what they're doing with a very cheap knife. So I don't want to discount anything like that. But on the other hand, you want something that's also going to match your personality. Uh, one of the things that we've been working on a lot is also making sure that you can have something that's traveled, but that's also, uh, that can also be high tech and can meet modern means and stuff like that. So for example, this knife here, this, uh, another one of our reverse edge knives. Uh, a lot of people like the travel pattern on this, the, the reindeer antler, the travel wrapping, the s skull carved, um, but one of the things you don't see in this knife looking at is that this knife also has a hidden handcuff key pocket that you can pull up quickly. <laughs> this knife is, uh, the sheath is Bluetooth compatible, NFC compatible. So you can actually embed codes and stuff like that that you want to hide in something as simple as a knife sheath. So it looks old. It looks like it's a classic old design, but <laughs> um, it's, you can connect your phone to it. You can write code on it. You can embed codes in it. You can drop it places. And that's not likely going to be a place that somebody's going to run through a Bluetooth scanner or an NFC scanner. Um, so they look old. They have that pattern. They have that customization. They have uh, that feel that a lot of people want to have, that they're connected to those those old-time warriors, those old-time soldiers and stuff like that. And at the same time, uh, they're able to express some kind of it individuality and stuff like that same thing with this this is i told you i carried an sog pentagon for a while this is kind of what i wanted from the pentagon so this is a brown to tip dagger so the bevels do not go all the way to the end this is rounded here it's chiseled brown so bevels only on one side and that's so that i can differentiate between the edges when i'm using it so i know which edge I'm going to use at which point. Uh, and people used to do this a lot with, let's say, like the Microtech Crosshair, the SOG Pentagon. You'd have a serrated edge and a plain edge. Mm -hmm. And you would set them up in a way that you could differentiate which edge you were using at any given point. Um, but the problem with all those daggers was always that they had a, a tip that was very weak. It was easy to break off. So this rounded tip kind of allows you to use both edges without necessarily worrying about a fragile tip. And the same thing with this, this is a NFC compatible sheet. So you can actually connect your phone up to this, Bluetooth, anything like this. With the ones that we made so far, uh, when you get them, you can connect your phone to it. Uh, and it has to be on a certain part on the sheet. Uh, so we'll let everybody know that, but know where that is on each individual sheet. But you can connect your phone to here and you can embed any message you want in the phone. You can have your uh, name, phone number, you can have embedded codes, you can have anything like that that a lot of those people look for. And then again, they have the hidden handcuff key pockets and everything like that. That's, uh, that is very cool. Uh, and I love the round tip dagger. That's something uh, that that I think uh, I've seen from middle age daggers and mm -hmm. and that kind of thing for slipping or for, for um, punching through mail chain mail mm -hmm. because it's so strong right there at the tip um uh i i want to ask you about the name of your company but before i do uh, i mentioned up front uh ethan curtis of vandrare knives is your brother and i know that uh, uh you guys uh, did a little bit of knife making uh early on together and uh, i think that's cool i love um i love knife making family uh stories you seem to have some some of the same uh, spirit uh, behind your knife making. Your work is very different, uh, but you seem to have some of that the same, you know, uh, 
well, spirit behind the work you guys do. It, yeah, I think I, I think no matter what the goal with or no matter what the designs look like, really the biggest concern is the end goal. What what kind of product are you gonna end up with? Um, Ethan is great at using G10. He does a great sculpted handle. Uh, he's great with his finishes. Um, and you can, it, it, I think Ethan is honestly one of the most responsive people to what uh, his customers ask for. So when he sees a, a change or a trend, he adjusts that right away. I think one of the things that we, where we kind of uh, differ is, I, at the end of it, I want to I want to make something that looks old. I want to make something that looks unique and uh, and my style with these patterns. And Ethan is so good about being consistent, which is something I think that you wouldn't get between the two of us. I think you'd have to look at a knife from me and say like this that I want that one. I, not oh. one of group. I want that specific one. Whereas Ethan, you can order a knife from him, and you're going to get a knife that looks the same every bit of time i think the other difference obviously i'm better looking <laughs> obviously uh obviously i'm doing leather work and he's doing kydex uh there there's some differences there um but for the most part i think what we have that is very similar between our two kind of knife making approaches is that the end result is that you have a knife that meets a user's needs yeah. And that's one of the things you'll see, even with the pictures on our Instagram and stuff like that. I'm very particular about where they're taken. My wife takes all those photos. She edits them. She puts a lot of that stuff together. She's a super big help. But for example, with uh, we have something like this two handed prong here mm. with a napped pattern. We when we go to areas and she uh, she wants to. Uh, she picks out some knives to take. I'm very particular. So she wanted to take that out recently to an area that didn't have anything that you would chop down. It was an open field. And I was very, that's the only thing I jump in on is, Hey, look, that's not going to show an end user what we're looking at. There's nothing <laughs> yeah. to chop here. We don't need a two handed knife. Let's take some other stuff and go out there. So, um, that's kind of the, the approach and the mindset by what, you know, behind why we do some of those things. So uh, in in history, I, I I I sort of touched on this before, but I forgot to follow up. Uh, historically speaking, what's your favorite sort of era of knives uh, besides our current one? Uh, I I think if I had to look at, I think it's very hard. I think when I think I like looking at places regionally. Yeah. Okay. More so than timeline based, yeah. I think. My favorite region would definitely be kind of that Scandinavian area. Um, when, and I think you, you see the same thing where uh, axes, saxes, pucos, the, they're all still used the same way. Um, I really like looking at places regionally more than historically. Yeah. And if an, if an area has had a knife design for hundreds of years, that's because it works in that area um same thing like i was saying about taking those pictures there you know you there's not a perfect knife for every occasion you're never going to find that one perfect knife that works everywhere but there is a knife that's going to work great in some of the places that uh in some of the regionally specific places that you go uh that's what i love uh filipino weapons for you know mm -hmm. the philippines so many islands and so many municipalities and each one has their patron blade shape and then they have this whole you know vocabulary of blade shapes that change from north to south and um yeah i i, I love the variety and talk about uh talk about knives and weapons that are made for their environment you know uh they're all pretty short they have one giant you know one large battle sword but everything else is kind of under 29 inches jungle you know close mm -hmm. in and uh yeah that's uh that's that's an interesting uh way of looking at it taking pictures or kind of staging them in places that are relevant to what they what they do yeah i think it's important i mean i think you could i think 
you you could take a machete, bring it out here. You get some great pictures in the snow and the ice and stuff like that. But <laughs> a one eighth inch thick machete is going to be horrible against a frozen black spruce up here at these temperatures. Right, just so shatter. It, yeah, it do, it doesn't make sense to always apply one to look at one tool for everything. So typically, what I like to do is either uh, look at people who, when I was in the military, when I was uh, with DA, um, I like to look at the tools that were successful in those certain environments, and then I like to look at uh, tools that were in the army tools that are uh, successful in that region. Uh, I've got one here. I think we. I think I may have this post. I don't know if I have this one post or not. When I left the DA, one of the things that we were looking at, and I'll give you a, a good example. Uh, this is a small knife, very small, designed to fit in an Altoids can. We made this, uh, I've made the first one probably 15, 16 years ago. Uh, it's designed where you can hold it from the back. You can carry it in a very small area. It's chisel ground because a lot of people who like to carry or who used to carry these small area these knives uh in intel areas would often put two pieces of masking tape or uh, medical tape on their leg put this a knife like this that was chisel ground over that and then cover the top with medical tape so that if you were caught with it in a search uh it would be harder to find because it wouldn't be a sheath it wouldn't be any bigger it'd be mm. in an area that you could tape it down um but on the same hand you can use it as a punch knife if you need to get out of an area quickly one of the things that i like to do and i cut this earlier i like to cut sticks and the other thing with this being chisel ground is that if you were to carve a stick to hold it the chisel ground makes that square notch very very easy to obtain hmm. so i cut in here i cut down from the top and then i'll usually make two notches in the back and sell these with a uh, length of cords so that you can tie it on and then you have you can either use it like a spear or make a lot larger handle to hold on to as a knife oh, cool um when i left the doj that's what i gave uh everybody as a or all the undercover officers as a parting gift something that they could have on them at all times small uh easy to hide and still very effective for a variety of tasks oh man i love a chisel grind i love how yeah. sharp they are you know and uh, a lot of people initially are shy about them. Uh, that maybe they track a little oddly through materials until you get used mm -hmm. to it. But uh, but I I love a good chisel ground blade. And that that one there looks nasty. I love the the punch dagger uh, effect you can get out of it. I wanted to ask you about uh, the name "Polite but Dangerous Tools." Um, and, and maybe wrap with your philosophy. Tell me about your philosophy and what goes into that name. Uh, so the name uh, came from uh, an experience I had when I was working with the DOJ. We were doing uh, opioid diversion investigations. Like I said, um, I was working with the DA at this time. Typically what we do is an investigation will take about a year. You'd interview pharmacists, doctors, patients, everything like that. But what we would, typically do is wait outside of an area, see who walked in and kind of get a feel for a pharmacy or something like that. Uh, I was there with a DA agent. I was an Intel contractor at the time. Uh, the DA agent who uh, I worked with all the time, he looks up and he's local to the area and he sees somebody walking into the pharmacy and he says, hey, you see that guy there? He's generally polite but dangerous. And the moment he said that, I thought, it's one of the coolest things I've ever heard. I want it written on my headstone. I want people in a hundred years to come by my grave and be like, wow, Sam Curtis, generally polite, but dangerous. Uh, <laughs> so I love that. But also I think you, a lot of the knives, I mean, I, I think it fits with the style of the knives too. For example, showing this fruit knife, uh, you've got something that's originally meant to cut fruit with a African guarding tool, it's originally meant for a garden. It's very easy to see how it could be forced into uh, a tactical utility knife. Um, but that's not what its original purpose was. Right. And so it, that's kind of the philosophy I take with a lot of these knives. I want them to look older. I want them to look antiqued. I want them to be originally built for something constructive and built in a way that they 
also can do something uh, deconstructive, I guess, if possible. Well, Sam, I, I, that's a great note to end on, uh, deconstructive. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I really appreciate it. I think your knives are really beautiful, uh, but I also love knowing how uh, robust and and uh, well thought out they are too. They're not just uh, wall, you know, pretty looking wall hangers uh, by any stretch. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on the show, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at theknifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkie's merchandise at the knifejunkie.com slash shop. Uh, I forgot to ask Sam uh, on the air here the best way to get in touch with him to uh, get one of his beautiful knives. And I happen to know it is through Instagram. So definitely follow him on Instagram. Uh, it's serious eye candy uh, regularly. Uh, but that's also a great way to get in touch with him uh, to, to get one of his beautiful knives. Uh, so there he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Sam Curtis of Polite But Dangerous Tools. Be sure to join us again next Sunday for another great interview and uh, the Wednesday for the Wednesday Supplemental and then Thursday for Thursday Night Knives. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.